Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Dr. Lauren Rudolph, a guest moderator for Dr. Cruz, who had um, another commitment. I am pleased to introduce to you Dr. Alex Wynn. He is a sports fellow from Peace Health, which is in Vancouver, Washington. And he traveled all the way across the country, originally from Florida. He's done uh, Florida State Medical School. And then um, in Florida, he did family medicine residency with the US Air Force. And I believe he'll be returning to Florida to join an orthopedic group in the following uh, year. Um, so Alex, feel free to uh, take it away and take a share screen. I will mute myself. Okay, perfect. Let me just get my slides up here. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah, that looks great. Okay. And you, you sound good too. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yeah, so this is the, uh, the case here is for quadrilateral space syndrome. I'd like to thank everybody for inviting me. I appreciate that. So we'll go through this uh, slide set here. I will say this isn't uh, from an actual case, so it's a combination of pictures of normal um, ultrasound pictures that we obtained in clinic, as well as some pathology pictures that were obtained from journal articles. And it'll be a quick review of the quadrilateral space syndrome, particularly on the ultrasound protocol of it. Uh, I didn't cover the full shoulder ultrasound protocol, which Dr. Maderick Hall um, did excellent with his calcific tendinopathy uh, YouTube um, lecture previously. So this will focus mainly on quadrilateral space syndrome ultrasound. So these are the topics that we're gonna cover. So we're gonna talk about the case initially, some introduction information regarding quadrilateral space syndrome, and then focus on the ultrasound, including the protocol, positioning, review some images, some differential pictures, um, and then we'll talk about the ultrasound report and then the outcome as well. <clears throat> so this is our case here, 35-year-old uh, right-hand dominant male, three months of right posterior lateral shoulder pain, uh, worse particularly after joining CrossFit gym three months ago, worse with overhead activities, overhead lifting, sleeping at night. And then he also feels some numbness tingling in the lateral shoulder area as well. And this is a picture of our uh, theoretical case doing an overhead lift here. So on his uh, shoulder exam, he had some mild atrophy of the deltoid, teres minor area, um, some poorly localized pain over the posterior lateral shoulder area, and some weakness and pain with external rotation compared to the other side. And he has some diminished sensation to light touch over the lateral part of his shoulder. And so some quick introduction information regarding quadrilateral space syndrome. It's fairly rare. Um, I've seen one case that was diagnosed retrospectively, um, particularly in a CrossFit athlete, but she got better just after activity modification. Um, so rare. Um, haven't seen many more cases other than that. Um, some risk factors, in particular, overhead athletes, particularly in people who do um, like baseball pitchers, for example, you might see it in volleyball players, tennis uh, players, or in this case, a CrossFit athlete. And then some mechanisms that have been proposed include muscular hypertrophy, uh, tight fibrous bands, uh, potentially a paralabral cyst that impinges on the quadrilateral space, um, or uh, post-traumatic. And so here's a slide regarding the anatomy here. So um, the neurovascular structures that run through the quadrilateral space would include the axillary nerve and then the posterior circumflex humeral artery that you see here. And then the borders, that's a common uh, board question uh, for quadrilateral space syndrome is superior, you're gonna see the teres minor here. Inferior is gonna be teres major tendon, and then medial is going to be the long head of the triceps, and then laterally you'll see the surgical neck of the humerus. So these are the four borders of the quadrilateral space syndrome. 
And so this uh, picture here is going to be very relevant in the next um, set of slides. So our differential, initial differential diagnosis for this patient would include quadrilateral space syndrome, uh, suprascapular neuropathy, Parsonage Turner syndrome, rotator cuff tear, and then subacromial bursitis. And so the initial workup for this patient, uh, showing a normal uh, right shoulder x-ray here. And then they also, we also did EMG studies on this patient uh, that were found to be normal for the axillary nerve. And so the, this is a picture of the complete ultrasound protocol here with standard images on the left here, and then some additional optional uh, images to obtain based on the presentation. And like I said, Dr. Madera Hall covered this uh, excellently in his uh, calcific tendinopathy shoulder uh, ultrasound series previously. So I'll focus mainly on the things in bold, uh, focusing on the quadrilateral space, uh, how to image that on ultrasound, as well as some of the differential um, diagnoses to obtain here. And so for the posterior uh, shoulder ultrasound, in particular, if your case has the differential that includes quadrilateral space syndrome, um, this is our typical setup here. Positioning would be in a seated position here. And then here's a picture of the anatomy of the quadrilateral space and the four borders here. And then this is the alignment of the transducer, typically using a linear transducer on most patients. And here's a, a picture comparing the transducer alignment compared with the picture here. And here's going to be cranial. Um, and then here's going to be caudal. And you'll typically see deltoid running overlying and then teres minor. And then the quadrilateral space with the neurovascular structures uh, right here. And so before I started imaging quadrilateral space syndrome, you know, it's kind of daunting, intimidating because we don't look at it that often. But uh, you know, after this um, series presentation, I would encourage everybody to view it. It's, it's relatively easy because you have the bony backdrop being the surgical neck of the humerus. Um, so very easy to identify and it's more lateral than you would typically think. Um, so you can see the transducer here is, is pretty more lateral than the uh, axilla. So. Uh, I would encourage everybody after this presentation to, to look at your neck shoulder patient that you do an ultrasound on, take a look at that, and it's pretty easy to identify, and you'll see the posterior circumflex humeral artery uh, beating here. And so that's, that's our transducer uh, alignment there, overlying the quadrilateral space. And because it's um, more lateral and the teres major tendon inserts anterior, you typically won't see that. You'll see the bony backdrop being the surgical neck of the humerus. So that's one thing to note. And so in our um, posterior shoulder ultrasound protocol, we also can evaluate the um, for muscular atrophy. So in particular, the quadrilateral space, uh, the axillary nerve runs through there. And so if it's being impinged upon, especially chronically, you can see uh, muscle atrophy, particularly of the teres minor and the deltoid. And in the ultrasound images, you can see reduced muscle size in that and fatty infiltration, which would show up as increased echogenicity. And so here's a, a table of the grading scale for muscle atrophy by ultrasound evaluation. And here you can see uh, on this pathology image uh, by ultrasound, you can see the teres minor here have increased echogenicity. Um, and so that can tell you that you have some fatty atrophy of that compared to the infraspinatus, which appears normal here, and the deltoid, which appears normal here. And so I included this picture here as the MRI correlate. Uh, and you can see how the teres minor has the fatty infiltration and so on MRI, it would look like this, and on ultrasound, it would look like this. So this would be similar. And so here's a, a picture uh, that we obtained in clinic. 
and play this Cine loop here. And you can see the posterior circumflex artery beating there. Um, so I'll play it again. And then you have deltoid here, teres minor, and uh, surgical neck of the humerus. And then transducer alignment would be like that. And you can see the artery beating there. All right. And so this is a Doppler image. So as we uh, discussed, the neurovascular structures that run through the quadrilateral space include the axillary nerve, but then the posterior circumflex humeral artery. So uh, as you know, to identify the nerve, the nerve run next, runs next to the artery, but you can see the artery really well in Doppler. Um, and I'll show you that here. And so in this patient, um, what you can also measure is the actually a nerve cross section. And when nerves get um, impinged upon distally, they can swell. And so in this picture, um, on the patient's pathologic side on the right, you can see the axillary nerve cross section is larger compared to the contralateral side. Um, it was measured at um, zero point. Uh, 1.4 on the right side, which is larger than 0 0.05 on the left side, which is the normal side. So nerve is uh, dilated or larger on the right side, which is where the patient has his, uh, symptoms. And then you can also measure the Doppler uh, blood flow velocity and because the quadrilateral space can impinge upon the posterior circumflex humeral artery, it can be a lower blood flow velocity. And that's shown here on the right side compared to the normal side on the left. And so some things that can um, also cause quadrilateral space syndrome um, can also be potentially a paralabral cyst. So I don't have a, picture of pathology of that by ultrasound, but you can imagine the same exact image, uh, imaging the quadrilateral space, but just imagine a, a large uh, anechoic um, black space here that impinges upon the, the axillary nerve and the nerve axillary structures in the quadrilateral space. And then here's an uh, MRI correlate here showing a paralabral cyst that can impinge upon the um, axillary nerve, which is right here. <clears throat> Some other things that can be in your differential for this uh, type of patient can also be splenoglenoid uh, notch cyst. So you image this typically looking at the posterior uh, glenohumeral joint, and then you can tilt um, and rotate your uh, transducer um, slightly with the medial side um, more superior, and you can see the uh, spinoglenoid notch. And then here's a picture of the spinal glenoid notch cyst, and then infraspinatus uh, right above that, and then the deltoid above that. Here's another picture of a different type of um, notch cyst, particularly in the suprascapular notch. Um, and this is more medial compared to the spinal glenoid notch. Um, here's pictures of that. And then you would see typically supraspinatus muscle on top and then trapezius above that. And so here's when we get to our um, shoulder, posterior shoulder ultrasound, the complete report. And then I put in bold um, the parts that we found that were pathologic on the um, posterior shoulder in particular. And so here we mentioned that the uh, teres minor muscles slight, showed slight increased echogenicity with partially visible intramuscular pennate pattern. So that basically shows us that we have isolated teres minor atrophy and fatty infiltration here. And then also mentioning the quadrilateral space and then the nerve vascular structures that run through that, uh, commenting that we have axillary nerve enlargement compared to the opposite side. And then posterior circumflex artery blood flow velocity is diminished at the quadrilateral space. And then our findings are suspicious for uh, quadrilateral space syndrome. We typically have this templated out in an epic dot phrase. And so we can alter 
uh, or edit the parts that are um, pathologic compared to the other things that we are shown to be normal. And so in the treatment of this patient, uh, we decide to do an ultrasound guided um, axillary nerve steroid injection to, for both uh, diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. And so this is the transducer alignment for the quadrilateral space. And then the needle would typically uh, come from superior to inferior. And this is the uh, ultrasound image of that. And you can see the needle coming uh, superior to inferior, reaching near the quadrilateral space and then injecting um, right there. And so for our patients, uh, after the uh, ultrasound guided injection into the quadrilateral space had uh, immediate pain relief, and then they were able to return to CrossFit um, after relative rest for one month. And so some quick take home points for quadrilateral space syndrome, it's uh, rare and uh, diagnosis of exclusion. So you gotta keep in mind all those other things that are more common that can present similarly. Um, and then you can use your shoulder ultrasound protocol to rule out these other causes. And then the ultrasound can evaluate for rotator cuff muscle uh, atrophy and fatty infiltration. So we showed that with the teres minor with increased echogenicity um, and then the decreased size. And then you can also use Doppler uh, to identify the artery and then the nerve runs right next to the artery in the quadrilateral space. Then you can also uh, potentially, depending on the resolution of your ultrasound machine, measure the cross section of the axillary nerve compared to the other side to see if it's enlarged. And then you can also measure the uh, artery velocity to see if it's diminished compared to the other side. And then a lot of times in these cases, from what I've uh, been reading, is the EMG could be a false negative. So don't uh, rely on that to rule out quadrilateral space. So an ultrasound could be a helpful uh, adjunctive. Uh, measure for that diagnosis. And so I'd like to acknowledge my mentors at Peace Health, Dr. Kevin DeWeber uh, and Dr. Brian Lowell, as well as at uh, Rebound Orthopedics, the orthopedic group that I work at, uh, Dr. Jared Cottrell for all their uh, help and all the skills that I've learned have, have come from them typically. And so these are some reference references that I used, particularly to pull off those uh, pathology pictures there. So that's it. You guys have any questions? Dr. Wynn, very good presentation. Uh, um, I appreciate that and, and uh, look forward to looking for this space more often. Um, when I've never done myself in practice measuring velocity of, of arterial blood flow through uh, the vasculature, uh, particularly of the shoulder and in that space, is it normal practice to have a, uh, an athlete do these studies under pre and post exercise, or was this just done with the patient at baseline? Um, from what I was reading, this was done with the patient at baseline. So, um, but yeah, I think that could be a reasonable thing as well to try after exercise to see if it changes. Um, but you could potentially see it at, at baseline as well. And then from what I was reading, it doesn't always happen in athletes. For one case that I was reading, it happened in a 50 year old patient who was working as like a grocery store cashier. And I guess the movements and moving objects um, just caused her symptoms and she got better with that. Um, quadrilateral space injection. So interesting cases, yeah. Any other questions? Has anybody else uh, seen quadrilateral space syndrome in their clinics? Hey, this is Lauren. Um, great job. Alex, really appreciated the deep dive into this specific pathology, because as you mentioned, I think a lot of us really aren't um, scanning this area and probably should be because, um, it, well, so you, as you mentioned, so the updated curriculum for sports medicine 
uh, fellows, which was published most recently in 2021, has this as one of the optional. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Has one of the optional. As one as this is one of the optional areas. However, I think to note, you know, you're going through your stand. If you're going through your standard protocol and you're seeing, and and the patient has posterior lateral shoulder pain, and everything's normal, and then. You know, maybe you know, we're looking at Terry's minor. So the possibility that Terry's minor has some increased um, echogenicity, some fatty atrophy, sort of hyperechoic, maybe smaller user contralateral comparison, um, then this, you know, makes sense. It's right there. Yeah. And so I think that was really helpful just, you know, to, for us to start doing more often and to show how easy it is to just move right from the, let the, the Terry's minor location. So great job. Thank you. Yeah. I will start adding that for sure. This is yeah. definitely not an area that I um, <clears throat> have seen. Yeah, I will scan it from time to time when someone has posterior lateral shoulder pain. I will admit I have not seen pathology there. However, it's definitely possible that it has seen me. So this has been really helpful um, and much appreciated. I think. Let me just see if there's any other points. Oh, great board question call out, especially for this time of year, the four borders of the quadrilateral space, Terry's minor, Terry's major, um, triceps, long head, and humerus. So um, great plug for that. I always love a good board question call out. Um, and then, yeah, we talked about protocols. Wanted to also just um, open it up for any additional questions or comments from the, from the group before we conclude. You're getting a lot of great job comments in the chat. You have a, you have a large following, it appears. Yeah, good support. <laughs> I'll just mention, Alex, that was a great case because I worry about how much this condition presents in our clinics and we may just fail to recognize it because we don't think about it and we don't look for it. So maintaining a high clin uh, index of suspicion is always important. And uh, we appreciate you telling us about this, this case. Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, I got a quick question. I don't know if you can hear me. Hey. Hi, this is Aaron Wass, also over in Vancouver, Washington. Um, I don't know if I missed it. What is the normal area for the axillary nerve on ultrasound in the quadrilateral space? From, from my reading, I couldn't find any normal findings. Um, but in the case that I presented from their journal article, they just compared it to the other side. So in this case, um, they showed that the axillary nerve was enlarged in the patient's symptomatic side compared to the normal side, which was smaller, but I couldn't find any normal values for it, like we have for the median nerve. Yeah, I um, agree with you. I took a brief look and didn't see anything for normals, um, which, like you said, contralateral comparison um, is super helpful if you can get a long access and see some, you know, change in caliper from uh, proximal to distal kind of scanning. If you, if you see an abrupt change in caliber um, in short access or in long access, that could be helpful. The contralateral, contralateral comparison that you mentioned. Um, and then um, if, there, if there aren't normals out there, this would be a great, easy, pretty easy study. to add if anyone's looking to start um, a study for, for next year, incoming fellows. Um, okay, so anyone else have any comments or questions? Again, great job, Alex, really appreciated um, this deep dive into the specific area and this pathology. I think we'll see a lot more people scanning this regularly and adding this to their standard protocol. So that's great. Um, wanted to end with a quick announcement. 
Um, next talk is on 5-6-2022 with Dr. Fabian Eros on common flexor pronator tendinosis. Um, and I believe Dr. Ryan Cruz will be back moderating for that as well. So I will um, end the recording unless anyone else has anything else they wanna add. Sorry, can I ask real quick, what, yeah. what were her presenting symptoms again? So for this, uh, it was a CrossFit athlete uh, who had right posterolateral shoulder pain, uh, worse with overhead movements. Um, and then for about three months after joining CrossFit and doing more overhead lifting, and then on exam, they had um, some potential uh, atrophy of the teres minor and deltoid area and then some numbness tingling over the lateral deltoid, and then pain that was poorly localized in the posterior lateral uh, right shoulder area. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thanks for the questions. And again, great job, Alex. Does anyone else have anything else they want to comment on or um, things they've seen similarly in their practice or questions for Dr. Nguyen, Dr. Nguyen 